I'm Casey James, and this is the story of the Bridge House. Digging up the charm bottle was easier than I expected. It was only half buried, surfacing in the mud under the roses as if the rain had brought it up. A small, square, blue glass bottle. Like a 1920s perfume bottle, with something dry inside that rattled when I tipped it. I couldn't see in the dark what was inside, but I probably didn't want to know either. Mud clung to it, dark and sticky as the scent of the roses all around me, and I had this awful intuition that if I looked closely, I'd see bones or something inside. I thought about just leaving it, leaving her. I did. But you know what's probably worse than meeting a ghost? Excuse me, a four-dimensional being made up of static in time. Pissing one off. So I dug up the bottle. Then I went inside. I still had to find that one last element. The missing one. The light, whatever that meant. Which probably meant I needed to venture downstairs, since I'd already tried up and there was nothing in the kitchen or living room that looked like it could help. Or in the music room. There was no sign of my not-a-ghost, though I was distinctly aware of her little blue bottle where it sat in my shoulder bag, beside the flute and the silver key and the glass jar I'd picked up upstairs. I glanced behind me, up the stairs, before I stepped back into the bridge house. But the translucent image of her was gone, like a mirage looked at from the wrong angle. All that I saw was the slick, black stone stairs, and the vividly blooming red roses, and the rain. The side door of the veranda led into the music room. I suppose I was lucky it was unlocked, that I didn't have to skirt the entire house and go in through the front door again although I doubt I could actually get much wetter by now. My shirt is soaked through and stuck to me. My hair is dripping and I'm cold. At least indoors there's no wind to contend with, I suppose, even if there are all sorts of creepy crawlies instead. The less said about the music room, the better. The furniture watched me, silently judging, as I trailed mud and rainwater inside. I didn't pause long enough to see the fawn again, and I didn't even look at the cabinet and the statuette in it. It didn't help very much. I was still skin-crawlingly aware of it as I walked through into the living room. The ruddy light in the living room made the autumn colours brighter, sharper, as if I had stepped somehow into a clearing in some fantasy forest, red and golden leaves filling the spaces where my imagination painted trees and stretching up to the ceiling, carpeting the ground. It was better than imagining the carpet as a pool of blood, which is the other thing it reminded me of. In the corner, the piano squatted, still watching me. I wonder if I looked at it for long enough, if I would see or imagine a person there, some hulking servant, or a tall, thin person of indeterminate profession, or a creature, perhaps, something that was never human, like the thing in the puddle upstairs, the vodnik. On that thought, I hurried across the room and into the entrance hall, where stairs coiled downwards, presumably to the basement. I don't like basements. I haven't been in many, to be fair, but I've seen my share of horror films, and I know the tropes. Basements are where you die. So I can't say I was looking forward to whatever I'd find down there as I crept down the stairs, and it was a surprise to find a perfectly ordinary sunken living room Den, really, 
at the base of the stairs. To my right, a solid black door hid whatever nightmare resided directly beneath that scorched and ash-filled study. I opened the door. A waft of soft light and humidity breathed out as I opened the door, the air fragrant with the smell of living, growing plants and greenery. The sound of water tinkling and trickling broke the oppressive quiet, and I stepped through the door almost without thought. Inside was one of the most beautiful spaces that I've ever seen. Vines and tendrils crept down the walls and climbed on trellises scattered throughout the room, while potted trees reached toward the ceiling, grasping at the lights there and stretching towards the narrow windows that ran along the top of the wall. Between them, pools of water were set into the floor and into raised blocks of stone, causing the light to refract up and break into reflections and wavy, watery shadows. The pools were dense with plant life, too, some sort of seaweed, or pondweed, and water lilies blossoming on the surface. Oh, this is a good spot, said the voice of the not-a-ghost from the stairs close behind me. I flinched sideways, and I may have let out a slightly undignified sound of surprise and alarm. She was there, at my elbow, half a step behind me. Could, could you not do that? I snapped. She just smiled at me, that suggestion of sharp teeth almost hidden behind the lips of her ever-changing face. Do what? She asked. Just... <sighs> I took a deep breath and tried to calm my still racing heart. Never mind. Do you know where I can find a light? I do not, she said. I have been waiting on the doorstep for a long while, but I have not been inside the gate before. The gate? You mentioned that before, I said. And so did the, um, person, creature, entity, in the tower. Do you mean the house? Walker, said the not a ghost. Right, I said. I was glad to have a name, even if I would rather not have needed to have one. Walker, is there something I should call you, by the way? If you're going to uh, manifest randomly, I should probably... I am called Ariel, she said. Right, I said again, as if that would make everything make more sense somehow. Right, okay. Ariel, nice to meet you. So, the house is the gate? They are coincident at this time, she said. That's like yes, I said, just to be sure. Yes. I shouldn't really have been surprised. There had to be some sort of reason that I'd been dreaming of this place, and I doubt a collection of ghosts and not exactly ghosts was enough to disturb my sleep from the other side of the country. I walked over to one of the ponds and sat on the edge, looking into the water. What did you mean about a threshold? I asked her. You mentioned it before. My being here lowered the chance of a breakthrough event on this threshold by, was it 5%? Just over 5% actually, but the fractions are not significant. Sure. So, what is the threshold? Threshold of what? Or to what? You don't really want to know. Nor do you have the sensory capability to perceive it and retain the integrity of your spirit. It's something bad, isn't it? Bad is a matter of perspective, said Ariel. 
You are no longer part of the world on the other side, nor yet part of the dream. So from your own perspective, it is quite neutral. I frowned. That sounds like something bad. Is there a summary version that you can tell me without my mind snapping? Ariel looked at me for a moment, her head tilted slightly, and her eyes luminescing like a cat's. Reality is much bigger than your perception of it. Like a crystal. Thresholds are like facets or flaws in the crystal, points where things touch and go a bit outside the boundaries. Small ones just add a bit of colour. Big ones have the potential to shatter reality completely, at least from some angles. And this is a big one, I guessed. She just smiled at me. Something reached out of the pond and grabbed my wrist, quick and silent as a snake striking. Now seems like it would be a good time to close that particular doorway, said Ariel brightly. No kidding! I yanked my arm back, trying to break the grip of whatever horrific creature had its knobbly fingers around my wrist. It held on tighter, thin fingers digging into my skin, hard enough to bruise. Another hand began to rise from the surface of the pond, long, thin fingers reaching for me. It wasn't quite the same as the clawed, twig-like fingers of the vodnik upstairs, but it wasn't different enough to make me feel very much better about it. How do I close the door? I asked, panting and more than halfway back to fight-or-flight panic mode, still trying to pull my arm away from whatever had grabbed me. Do I need the key again? Or the... what... what was it? The, the breath of Osiris? I don't have the ether stone. No tools are necessary, she said. You only have to look at it the right way and see the door. Then you can close it. Look at what the right way? I asked. The local time-space continuum, said Ariel, almost as if she was surprised I would ask. What else would you look at using that nervous inocular system? I'm confused, I said. The thing holding my wrist started tugging on it, pulling me closer to the pool of water. Just... She paused and looked at me again with those cold, alien grey eyes. Then she said, Stop focusing so hard. Doorways are slippery, like reflections. They won't come to you if you're staring at them. I'm not staring at it, I said, yanking my arm out of the grip of the thing in the pond, finally. I backed away from the water, cradling my bruised wrist and trying to ignore the bloody scratches in it where the water thing's fingernails had ripped into me. Imagine... She paused, then said, Imagine it like music. A secret chord. Vibrations between worlds. A chord, I repeated. I glanced at her, then stared at the ink-dark hands reaching out of the pool like questing blind worms, narrow fingers tipped with long, spiny fingernails that moved like reeds in the water. I could almost hear it, that secret chord, the vibrating hum of it between this pool and some other darker body of water, swelling and surging like my heartbeat. There were things there, shadows, moving in the water. Not human shapes, though they had hands and fingers, limbs that might have been arms or legs or tentacles, eyes, all shut, dreamlessly sleeping in the dark. I heard a sound like a thousand flutes playing something that wasn't music, a tonal whale song that I heard through my skin and my eyes and the vibration of my bones. Something tickled at my lip, and I wiped at it, unsurprised when my hand came away smeared with blood. The metallic taste of it filled my mouth as I tipped my head back to stop the nosebleed. 
No, I, I don't think I can do it that way, I said. Can you shut the door? I can't even touch you, she said. Not until everything merges. I'm not real, Casey James. I swallowed, then gagged slightly as I swallowed my own blood. The pool shone and glimmered like moonlight. Then I need a different plan, I told her. This was one of those times that I wished Eddie was still around. He'd have come with me, chasing a dream across the country on the strength of a hunch. Hell, he wouldn't have let me come on my own. And Eddie would have known how to translate Ariel's instructions into something I could use. Always believed in the weird stuff, he did, even when I didn't. He said it was all just code, like computer code, not ciphers. But Eddie didn't exist anymore. As far as I could tell, he hadn't ever existed. Not for anyone except me. I can't quite believe that I imagined the sarcastic son of a bitch entirely, but there have been days when I wondered. In any case, what I needed right now was to think like Eddie. And Eddie used to say that everything could be understood. You just had to look at it the right way, speak its language. I didn't want to speak whatever language belonged to that thing, things, in the pond. But I didn't need to, did I? I just needed... You know that symbols function in all four dimensions, don't you? Asked Ariel, derailing my train of thought. What? I said. Symbols, she repeated. I forget that your ocular and nervous system isn't flexible enough to directly perceive seams in reality, because your brain is more than flexible enough to work around that lack, using symbols. Right, I muttered. I suppose symbols are like a language, definitely a code. So the question is, how do I symbolically close and lock a door? With a sigh, I slid my hand into my shoulder bag, and my fingers found the key immediately, as if it had been waiting for me. I shuddered. It was cold to the touch, which is normal for a metal key, but it didn't feel normal. It felt colder than it should be, like picking up something carved out of ice. Somewhere I could hear a clock ticking. I took the key out. Symbols, I reminded myself. <sighs> step by cautious, reluctant step, I approached the pool, listening for that strange chord. The spiny fingers of the things in the pond, Vodnik or Nixies or whatever they were, trembled and turned towards me as I moved. They rose further out of the water, longer than fingers or arms should be, just black, tentacle-like limbs tipped with spines like fingernails, blindly reaching for me. When I touched the key to the surface of the water, the faint chord of whale song turned into a low groaning noise, almost subsonic, the sound of reality itself bending, protesting the weight of something that shouldn't exist, and under it, music. Just this weird little melody repeating over and over again as the moonshine glimmer of the water faded into a flickering reflection of the grow lights that were somehow still powered up and turned on down here. As the spine-tipped fingers reaching out of the water vanished into shadows and ripples without a sound. Ariel smiled at me. That was well done. She said, 